And good afternoon. This is Brian Ross, your host for the next three hours, along with veteran trial lawyer Terry Austin. Terry, thanks for being here. We're going to go back to the courtroom in Palm Beach County, Florida, in the murder trial of Christopher Sada. So the uh, technician who did the DNA is being cross-examined now by the lawyer for uh, Mr. Vasada. This is awfully dry material for a jury, isn't it? It's absolutely dry. They have to put it in, though, and so they're getting it in through this forensic witness, and hopefully, in summations, it'll be a little more clear for the jury. It does give you an idea, though, of what goes into bringing a major case like this, the amount of work that's done behind the scenes with technicians and every last piece of evidence analyzed to see if there's a DNA match. Exactly. It's very important to get it all in or to exclude if it's not showing that there's one defendant who's involved. Right. And we have a jury here of uh, uh, 14 people, two alternates there. Uh, I take it the idea is to put this in first so it doesn't uh, get in the way as you go through the... Uh, the rest of the trial and bring out actually the narrative of what happened. Exactly. I think what the prosecution is going to try to show is the fact that, you know, this is who was on the scene and this who wasn't on the scene, and then they'll, you know, establish more facts as they go along. Okay, let's pick up the uh, testimony. So that concludes the questioning of the forensic scientist. Uh, Terry Austin, let me ask you, uh, this is, as we were saying, dry material, but important to lay out the case. It's very important. And remember, this case has three to four defendants. You have Vasuda, who's on trial now. You have the individual who allegedly was driving, Marcus Stewart, who was charged in another case. You have the Luke Vopico, I think is how you say his right. name, who isn't there because there's not enough DNA evidence. And you have the individual whose house where it occurred. He wasn't charged either, but he is serving time for an unrelated crime of possession of guns, etc. Which they discovered when they went to the crime scene. Exactly. What a mess the Super Bowl party must have been. Yes. And now they're, uh, the judge is meeting with the lawyers, we think, to set the schedule for the rest of the day. Uh, he's indicated earlier that uh, this could be a short day. Uh, they've concluded the testimony of the forensic scientist. Uh, they've got the DNA. And it is fascinating to see sort of uh, how they exclude and what they talk about dropouts. When she says there are dropouts, what does that mean? What she's talking about is the fact that there's too little DNA evidence and there are false positives. And so there are dropouts. That means that she can't say conclusively that someone's DNA was on the scene. And is the jury at this point, are they taking notes? Uh, how do you keep track of all this if you're a juror? They are allowed to take notes and they can refer to their notes later. And some of them may very well be taking notes. But at the end of the day, I think it is the duty and the responsibility of the attorneys to make sure they sum up all this information. Terry Austin, thank you. We'll be back with our coverage. It will continue from uh, Palm Beach County. You're watching the Law and Crime Network. And welcome back. This is Brian Ross. We're continuing our coverage of the uh, Charles Vasada trial, the Christopher Vasada trial. Uh, the jury now has been sent home for the weekend, and the lawyers are talking with the judge you see there. Uh, Vasada off to the left. Uh, he is accused of murdering three people at a backyard Super Bowl party two years ago. And I'm here with Terry Austin. That's quite a charge, and they, the death penalty is on the table. Yes, absolutely. So the jury is going to be listening carefully to all of the testimony because it's very serious. So with the jury uh, sent home for the weekend, uh, we have a lot of other stories to catch up on, and Terry Austin's here to help us sort it out. First up, we'll go to what's been happening in the California courtroom where Charles Merritt was found guilty of murdering the McStay family. That was his business partner, Joseph McStay, uh, Joseph's wife, Summer, and their two young children, Gianni and Joseph Jr. The jury came to the decision last week on Friday and read the verdict this week on Monday. We're now in the penalty phase of that trial. The jury will have to decide if they want to put Charles Merritt to death. The jury is dark until next Tuesday, but we'll fill you in on what's happened in that courtroom so far. Also, the trial against South Carolina man Timothy Jones Jr. came to its conclusion yesterday. Jones was found guilty of murdering his five young children when he strangled them one by one and drove around the South with their bodies in the back seat of his SUV. We'll cover that case in just a little bit. And finally, we're live today, as you saw, with the trial against Christopher Vasada in Jupiter, Florida. This is the trial of the Super Bowl party gone horribly wrong. Vasada's accused of murdering three young people hanging out at a friend's house. For more information, let's hear from law and crime president Rachel Stockman. 
Super Bowl Sunday 2017, three young adults gunned down at a backyard party, a local Florida community shaken. There were just shots fired in our neighborhood. A neighbor called 911. Don't go outside. There was a bunch of gunfire. Somebody please call an ambulance okay. or call 911. Was it this man, Christopher Vasada, found by deputies shot and bleeding on the side of the road after the murders? He became a suspect fairly early in the investigation. He was charged and faces trial for three counts of murder and one attempted murder charge. But in a jailhouse call, Visada claims he was actually framed by police. The only surviving eyewitness could be key to the prosecution's case, but he's behind bars himself. He just said somebody came in their backyard and started shooting. Watch live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of this trial coming up on the Long Crime Network. I'm Rachel Stockman for Long Crime. Rachel Stockman, president of the Law and Crime Network. Terry Austin, as you hear the details of that case unfold, uh, this is going to be a lot for the jury to sort out, right? A gunfire back and forth, Vasada himself was shot. Absolutely. It's a little bit confusing. There are a lot of individuals involved and two innocent women who were there and also shot down. So it's a very difficult case. These uh, Super Bowl parties can often be uh, raucous. This one, obviously, something else was going on. Uh, they found guns, black masks. Was this a drug ripoff, you think? It absolutely sounds as if there was an argument between two separate groups for drugs and guns and other crimes that may have occurred. And so it sounds as though individuals came to this party and wanted revenge. Okay. Well, let's listen now to the opening statements in that case from the prosecution. Well, that's Officer Vincent Marinucci of the Jupiter Police Department. Terry Austin, uh, he laid out the uh, story there quite well, I thought. I think so as well. He's talking about an individual who's approaching him, but the officer's not sure whether or not this is a suspect or a victim. And as it turns out, Charles Vorpico is the individual. He's the one whose house where this occurred, and he was in a state of shock, apparently. And he will be a key witness. Yes, he will be. He's cooperating now with the prosecution. Right. And the defendant here says he was framed. If we have a good idea what he's talking about. Well, we'll have to see how the story plays out, but it's a dispute between, you know, competing, I guess, drug individuals who are involved with different crimes. Right. So, you know, it, it could very well be that there are two different stories to this. Lots of drugs, lots of guns in this small Florida community. It must be disturbing to the residents of Jupiter, Florida that this is going on. I would think so as well, particularly the house next door where Charles ran to. It must be very confusing. Well, Terry Austin, stay with us here. When we return, we'll dive into the conclusion of the trial against Timothy Jones in South Carolina. You're watching the Law and Crime Network. Terry, in this case, a horrific crime, five children murdered. He testified that one of the little girls said, Daddy, I love you, before he killed her. He claimed he was insane. That was the defense. The jury didn't buy it. They didn't buy it, and they have no sympathy for him. And if you look at Timothy Jones in the courtroom, he's sitting there stone-faced, and I think that had an effect on the jury. I think that's why they found him guilty and why they also recommended the death sentence. And now, given that death sentence, what will be the appeals? It takes forever once there's a death penalty decision, doesn't it? That's exactly right, which many argue is why it's not a real deterrent here in the United States, because it takes so long. With South Carolina here, we see they do have the death penalty, and they have invoked it in the past, and so it will happen at some point unless there's an appeal, and, and they win the appeal. The prosecutors were impassioned in delivering the argument for the death penalty. If there ever was a case, this was it, and they talked about it after the verdict. South Carolina solicitor, prosecutor Rick Hubbard, they came back in two hours. The jury was not out long in this case. They had made up their minds, I think, based on the evidence, and good for them. I think they had the courage to come to the conclusion that the evidence was dating to them. And I think the solicitor is correct. The nature of this crime was very horrendous. The fact that Nathan was the one who was beaten multiple times, apparently, and then he was the first one killed, and then the father took the lives of the rest of his children. And the, uh, in the closing arguments, arguing for the death penalty, the prosecutor said he didn't want anybody to have his children. 
Right, exactly, which is horrible because, I mean, there is still the mother in this case and the fact that now she's without her children. And there was also some evidence from teachers in the school who had been affected by the fact that these children were killed. Among those who testified, Terry, was the father of the defendant, Timothy Jones Sr. Timothy Jones Sr., asking that uh, the jury spare his son, which they did not, he began by showing the tattoos on his back of his five grandchildren who were killed by his son. Yes, it's an interesting situation. I mean, the grandfather clearly loved the grandchildren, and I think they're putting him on the stand to show that he also loves his son, and there's been enough lost here in this case. We saw the emotion of his son wiping away tears as his father testified. Uh, didn't have much impact on the jury, though, did it? It did not. And interestingly enough, Timothy Jones only showed these emotions when it came to his fate, not the fate of his children. Right. He was crying for himself. Exactly. Yeah, he was sad about what happened to him, not the children. That's right. And I think the jury fell for that and saw the fact that, you know, he has these tears. But what about the sympathy for your own children that you murdered at your own hand? One of the things we saw in this trial and other trials where children are killed is the fact that the failure of the state to investigate and to move in when children are at risk, at danger uh, from their parents. Exactly. It seems that the solicitor is saying, look, we're not blaming the welfare system here. And apparently they came to the home and the home showed signs of improvement. So there was really no reason to think that there might be something else going on here. But that always is a case, and I've always wondered in covering these kinds of cases myself, like where, where were the state authorities? And you find out they're overworked, they don't have the resources, they can't get out as often as they want. Exactly. That's, that's what happens. And here, when the call was made, and they did go in to look at the house, shortly thereafter, the murders occurred. So I think the teacher who reported the signs of abuse was feeling guilty herself. What would you say to people watching if they see that kind of thing themselves in their own communities? I think, obviously, you should report it. But then I think the report would have to say, listen, we think that the children are at risk. So while you're investigating, perhaps remove the children from the home. And people are always sort of hesitant to turn in a neighbor. That's like, right. not my business, but it should be, right? It should be everyone's business. The welfare of the children is the business of the whole community. And if someone had made a more of a call here, do you think it might have changed things? This is a man who shouldn't have had those kids, right? He should not have had those children. That's exactly right. You know, it's hard to say whether or not it would have made a difference. I would like to think it would have. Okay, Terry Austin, we're continuing our coverage here talking about the verdict in the Jones case. You're watching the Law and Crime Network.